you very much. Um, <clears throat> I would now like to invite uh, Professor Pinchas Alpert. Uh, Pinchas uh, has been the director of the Environmental Institute or Environmental Sciences that now resides in this new building. And uh, for most uh, scientists and other people in Israel, he is Mr. Climate Change. So, um, with not much more, I would give him the floor and just talk to this. And when you show something here, keep your head here. Okay? Yes. Thank you very much. So you already introduced me, but I would say one thing. I was five years the head of this school from 2008, and one of the first uh, meetings that I had as the head of the school was to decide which of the 14 architects that submitted proposals for this building we have to choose. So we have chosen the architect. If you like it or not, this is the building. <laughs> okay, so I am at the Department of Geosciences at Tel Aviv University, and I'm also a professor of meteorology, and thanks Christoph Kottemeyer for initial initiating this huge large project of the ZERV, which he presented now. Uh, and I will show some results following what we can do with this beautiful data, which we never had in Israel, anywhere in Israel, measured in the past, uh, I don't know, if, uh, in, never in the past. Okay. Let me start with the outline. How did I come to the whole issue of birds? I blame Yossi, uh, Yossi Leshem. And it started about 20 years ago with uh, the work with Judy Shamaun and also with Anat Be'arad, who did her master. And I entered this, I will show two or three slides how I come into this subject of birds and climate. This is the project of the ZERV, which includes many, many work packages. And my part is here at the work package seven, which is called the atmosphere, climate, weather, and atmospheric hazards. And I will show some results from that. And this is the group, which I don't have time to think to everybody working on the deserve team in Tel Aviv University, postdocs, PhD students, master students, some are here, and I will present some results. Now, this is how it started. About 20 years ago, Yossi has shown me this map, and uh, this is from Anat Barat thesis. I showed a couple of slides. This is many talked about it, Bioline and others. Many, many studies about this. 18 stalks that we had just at the beginning from 94 to 99. Really amazing story that you look how, what we looked at was how climate is affecting these birds or these stalks going all the way of about 11,000 kilometer. So using the satellites, I'm known, both for the birds, but also for the weather. And let me show you some of the results, which were very high correlations Bioline, this is relatively old stuff from 15 years ago. But for me, it was so impressive to get such huge correlations between weather, weather data, which is in this case the wind velocity compared to the birds' velocity. So there is, there is a very nice correlation which is close to 0.87. But there is not only correlation with the wind. There is also correlation with rainfall. And here, the total cloud cover is affecting the bird's velocity. 
So it's so nice, you can follow every bird and look every day what was the distance done by that bird and correlated with the weather. And this is another one, which is with the air temperature. When the air temperature goes up, it's better, the velocity goes higher. So this is how it started. What I'm going to show you in my talk is a very brief a review of what we have done in Israel in the regional climate modeling and what's going to happen in the next 30, 40 to 50 years. I am a favorite, unfortunately, of the global warming effects. I am uh, very, very worried about what's going to happen and we already see it in the last 30, 40 years. Unfortunately, the skepticism in Israel is high, which is very good for science, but in this case, it's not so good. Because we have to prepare. I think Sinaya was here. I'm not sure she is here. Yes. Okay. So we discussed it. It's really a serious matter. I want to show you some of the results. Very briefly, two or three slides for each, precipitation and temperature. What's going to happen here till 2060? And this was another German-Israeli project, which, which was called Glower Jordan River, the largest project, environmental project in Israel ever. It took about 12 years. It started in 2000. But I will show you some of the results. My group was responsible for generating high resolution climate predictions for Israel, for the Jordan River, for and for the Lake Kinneret. So this is the earlier simulations we have performed with that show reduction of rainfall, significant reduction of rainfall. When you look at the end of the century, 2071 to 2100, a drop of about 50 to 100 millimeters per year to the end of this century, which is really very bad. It's about, we are talking about 10% or even 20% of the rainfall, which we already noticed in the last, in recent years. This is the bad scenario, the, the, the worst scenario. The better scenario is B2, also reduction of about 50 millimeters per year. And there is also going to be reduction in the flow in the rivers. This is jointly with a group in Japan. And Jordan is here. You can see the current control run and what's going to happen with the medium scenario and with the worst scenario. It's going to drop to nearly zero. And we are talking not about the lower Jordan, about the upper Jordan. And it's already dropping. And this is happening all over the Mediterranean. There are several rivers here. You can see, except to the Nile, in which we have increases at the end of the century. And the reason is because the Nile, uh, the rainfall or the water for the Nile comes from the tropics, in which rainfall will increase. By the way, the global warming causes most of the Earth increases, precipitation increases. But we are located in subtropical region in which we will see the crisis. Let me show another results. Doing an ensemble of high resolution climate runs, I will not go into the details, but this requires high effort. There is an effort also in the ZERV uh, that is done in Karlsruhe. But we have done an example of high resolution climate runs to look at different, uh, different parameters. And the reason we do examples is because we reduce the uncertainty which is involved in climate predictions. And there are different uncertainties. Emissions, uh, the uncertainty in the global models, and in the regional models. So when you do an ensemble, you use different emissions, different global models, 
and different regional climate models. And you can get quite nice, see, uh, this is in this case, the annual amounts of rainfall in a station in North Israel, Kfar Giladi, and you can see that the models, the ensemble is doing very well in capturing the climate of the past 30 years uh, in Kfar Giladi, and this is what the model tells us is going to happen in the near 20 years. Now it's not future anymore. We are in 2015, but this is the beginning of the 20 years. You can see reduction in the mean, in the most frequent value, which is currently about 800 millimeters per year, is going to drop to about 700 or 650. And this is what the models tell us about later at the mid of the century, it's going to drop to about 500. And this is how it looks like when you look daily or uh, yearly rainfall. And we also look in extremes, which are very significant for bird migration. We didn't do it yet, but we know very well, I think Bayerland did several studies of extreme events, and we had recently something with stalks in the south. But you can see here what's going to happen in the future. Rain days over 20 millimeters, the different models all show reductions. But when you go to heavy rainfall, it was mentioned by Bayerland today, over 50 millimeters per day, these are going, several of the models show increases. This is the one compared to 1961 to 1990, what is going to be 2031 to 2060. And this is not talking about our grandchildren or great grandchildren. This is what we will feel and our children in the coming generation. And also consecutive dry days are going to increase. This is the temperature anomaly compared to 1960, to the all, for the period of 1961 to 2060, and this is already increasing rapidly, and uh, this is an example of two scenarios, I will skip that. Now again, extremes which are so relevant to the bird migration. Look what happened with heat wave duration index. All of the models agree they are going to increase. One is the current level. All show increases. And if you go to consecutive days over 40 degrees Celsius, all show increase by a factor of even two, even higher. And the same day, same thing for another extreme indicator, total days over 40 degrees Celsius. If this meeting was two weeks ago, you will have in Tel Aviv 37 degrees Celsius maximum, which was very unusual in the past climate. Now I want to show you something about what is going to happen with the climate, recent changes in the climate of the Dead Sea. So this is based on a paper we published about 20 years ago, before, uh, before a deserve, but it is the first paper looking into recent changes in the climate of the Dead Sea Valley, and is related to what Eli Raz has shown earlier. So this you already seen, the change about a third of the area of the Dead Sea was it has been shrinked from about 950 kilometers square in 1951 to about 680 kilometers square. And what we have done was looking in how the change in the area of the Dead Sea has affected the climate of the Dead Sea. Let me show you, this is the Dead Sea drop. Uh, that we discussed earlier. This is the increase of evaporation, of pen evaporation. 
which is measured by meteorological stations. And you can see that only in the Dead Sea Storm, we see this significant increase above four meters. Now, it passed the four meters at about uh, the 2000, year 2000, and this is sweet water. But you can calculate from the sweet water to get the numbers Christoph has been showing of about one meter from the Dead Sea. By the way, Christoph has shown from an energy balance station the evaporation from the Dead Sea itself. It's amazing. Till the serve last year, nobody has really measured it continuously in a very efficient way that was described here. Now, compared to Sedom, if you look at other stations in the Jordan Rift Valley, Eilat, for example, you don't see these increases, neither in the coastal area. So why is it that in the Dead Sea, in Sedom, we have such a significant increase in the pen evaporation? This was the focus of our research. And let me show you the two mechanisms, the two positive feedbacks that we found affected the pen evaporation. First, the area of the Dead Sea drops, salinity increases, evaporation from Dead Sea drops because of the salinity increases, the relative humidity then drops. Now I'm talking the relative humidity in the air, but this affects an increase on the pen evaporation. Another mechanism is, which we discovered was, the local lake breeze as weakened because of the drop of the area of the Dead Sea, temperature then rises because the local breezes mitigate, they keep the temperature not to be too high. This is how we can live in Tel Aviv, but not farther east in Jordan or in Iraq where the temperature rises in summer to 50 degrees Celsius. What saves us is the mitigation of the sea breeze. Now, the local Dead Sea breeze has weakened, the temperature has rise, the relative humidity dropped, similar to what happened from this mechanism, but this is again causes pen evaporation increases. Now, another question that we addressed, which is of very much interest, is the following. We know the two mechanisms, two, at least two different mechanisms, work on the Dead Sea area. The global warming and local effects, like what I described earlier. Changing of the Dead Sea area, which affects the Dead Sea breeze, etc. So can we separate these two effects, the global and the local effect? This was published recently, not recently, a few years ago, 2011. We did the regional and local climatic effects on the Dead Sea evaporation. And let me show you some of the results. The mathematics is not so interesting, but it is interesting because we found a way to separate two mechanisms. We looked at the average evaporation at the years of 2000, compared them, to the pen evaporation at the years of the 60s, and separated two contribution. One due to change in synoptics, in regional synoptic patterns, and the other due to intrinsic evaporation. Let me show you the basic result is the change in evaporation which between, during these 40 years, which is of about 70 centimeters, can be separated into one, which belongs to a synoptic contribution, frequency of different synoptic systems, and the intrinsic contribution, which is due to local contributions. 
And we have compared them in different synoptic systems. We have found, by the way, that three systems dominate the evaporation of the Dead Sea. It's not the same every day. When we have a Red Sea trough, it's affecting strongly the evaporation. But not only that, also the Vic, the Persian trough, which is typical for summer. So we calculated each system what happened through the years. And the result is that this 70 centimeters increase in the evaporation could be explained by the local phenomena, by the drying of the lake, and another part is by the global warming. Details I refer to the paper. Another thing I want to talk about, some very preliminary, five minutes, very excellent. I want to talk about several of the first results from DESERVE, the project presented by Christoph Kottemeyer. This is the area that we put in the model. We are running models, different models. And this is, by the way, the kit cube, as it is being seen. We have different types of, of wind tracer, cloud radar, SODAR, which is a sonic measurements, radio sound, and uh, this drometer, different, many, many different instruments. And uh, let me skip this because it's a very long list. The idea behind this kit cube, why is it called cube? It, the idea, wonderful idea, to cover 10 by 10 by 10 kilometer cube above the Dead Sea, above the Mesada. We never add this data in end, every second, every few seconds. We have the winds, we have the, the humidity. This is such a richness that we never had anywhere in the Middle East. So we are now playing with this data and enjoying it. Let me show you some of the results. This is the list of the kit cube instruments. It's multi-million euros of instruments brought to Israel. By the way, one set of the instrument arrived during a rocket attack on Ashkelon. And we were afraid, SCADs, they closed the port of Ashdod. And it was opened, there was a big, a big fear that it's not going, the whole thing is going to break down. But they opened it and the trucks took it, four trucks, during the SCAD attack on Ashkelon. <laughs> this is the, the energy balance station, which he already showed. I, we are going to see it tomorrow morning, those who are joining us. And these are the measurements. I will skip that. I want to show you some results from, this is a student, Jenny, master student. Uh, I think, uh, Yes, Christoph showed already some of the results, so I will skip. I will show some results from runs with the model. Here you can see the three-dimensional description of the vertical velocity, which we now have something to compare with. Here you can see the dust, a cross-section of the concentration of the dust and very high dust concentration in the Dead Sea Valley that we are investigating jointly with KIT. Uh, we can have also, this is another student, PhD student. You can see the entrance of the Mediterranean sea breeze into the Dead Sea Valley, and we can compare it. Another instrument is a silometer, which is a, which is a leader looking upward it's a micro leader, and it's it giving us, this is a height of about three kilometers, and you can see the concentration of the aerosols and how the boundary layer is changing with time. This is in Beidagan, but we have, we are going to analyze also in uh, the Dead Sea. Another project, 
is flesh flood was mentioned several I'm finishing and with this I think this is the last one we are using cellular data to give an advanced warning on flash floods and you can see by the way here Arad rain gauge, Shani rain gauge but you can see compared the cellular link data compared to radar which is much much better this was a flash flood in the Dead Sea on the January 7 to 10 2013 and this is the area and I will stop, no, Lee Sever is here, I will show it, and particularly when Professor Dr. Amnon talked about remote sensing, we are using MODIS data, very high resolution, to follow, we have one by one kilometer resolution that we can see where exactly the dust and the aerosols are in the atmosphere. I'm not sure much was done how the aerosols is affecting birds, but this is something that I wish to do. Yossi is not here, but I will stop here with this. Thank you very much.